So how many of you feed the birds? Any, anybody? Yeah, a lot of hands out there. I should say, how many of you feed the squirrels and the birds happen to get something? But uh, this was the first winter that Tammy and I really took seriously feeding the birds. We had a, a suet block feeder and a peanut butter log feeder and a seed feeder. And I loved watching the chickadees and the juncos. And, and any time Tammy saw a cardinal or a blue jay uh, come to one of the feeders, she would call out to me. But if I looked out at the window and just saw sparrows, I quickly lost interest. I mean, who cares about boring old sparrows? Well, it turns out that God does. Jesus uses sparrows as an example of how we don't need to worry. God takes care of even the most unloved birds, so God will take care of us. He says in in Matthew 10, Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And then over in Luke he says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. This is the first case of a volume discount. You know, two sparrows for one penny, but for two pennies you can get five sparrows. Now, perhaps Jesus' most famous statement about not worrying doesn't specifically mention sparrows, but, but the point is the same. It's over in Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? If God takes care of the birds, don't worry. God will take care of us. That's what Jesus says. But we do worry, don't we? And sometimes our worry causes us to try to control things with disastrous consequences. We try to control everyone around us. We try to control what happens to us. We even try to control nature. In 1958, the communist uh, Chinese government took it upon themselves to eliminate four major pests that they blamed for disease and hunger. Now these four pests were mosquitoes, rodents, flies, and sparrows. And probably not many of us would miss those. The sparrows in particular, they blamed for hunger because they said each sparrow eats four pounds of food in a year, and there were millions and millions of sparrows in China. If they just killed off all the sparrows, the people wouldn't have to worry so much about food. And so they organized the Smash Sparrow campaign. Millions of people joined sparrow eradication groups. Nests were smashed, the chicks were killed, adults were shot, and they undertook a sparrow harassment campaign of banging pots and pans and keeping the birds flying until they literally dropped from exhaustion. When the Polish embassy in Beijing denied the Chinese request to eliminate the sparrows at their embassy compound, the smashed sparrow campaigners surrounded the embassy and they beat on drums night and day. And in just two days, the embassy staff had to use shovels to clean up all the dead sparrows. China had taken control of the sparrow problem, except it didn't solve their worry about hunger. Turns out those sparrows ate a lot more than seeds. They also ate the insects that fed on the crops. And the locust population exploded 
with no sparrows to eat them. They devoured the crop and people began to starve. The official Chinese government estimate says 15 million people died in that famine. But the estimate is that many, many more died as well. The Chinese government eventually had to import sparrows from the Soviet Union to replenish the population. They were worried about what the sparrows ate, but their attempt to control things turned into a big disaster. Now, the Chinese aren't the only ones who have attempted to control things and found out that the, the consequences weren't exactly what they expected. Have you heard of the hygiene hypothesis? Anybody hear of this? The hygiene hypothesis, hypothesis is an attempt to explain why there has been such an increase in autoimmune diseases and allergies in the last hundred years, at least in developed countries like the U.S. and, and Europe. See, MS, IBS, type 1 diabetes, asthma, inflammatory diseases, and allergic disorders have all skyrocketed in developed countries. And the hygiene hypothesis says that, that one of the reasons for this <clears throat> is that we have kept things too clean for our kids. Parents have been so worried about their kids getting germs that their body hasn't been introduced to the kind of common dirt that most people throughout history experienced. And our immune system needs to learn what kinds of things are a big deal and what kinds of things can be ignored. And when it doesn't learn this early on, it tends to overreact to harmless things. And we get all these diseases. Now, now we're not talking about viruses like COVID or, uh, or colds even. We don't want our kids to get those at all. But trying to keep two th things too clean actually may make them sick. Studies have found that, that the dirtier the situation that you grew up in, the less likely you are to have one of those diseases that are allergic or, or autoimmune. Things like having contact with animals on a regular basis, or going to daycare early in life, or growing up uh, out on a farm, all these things expose us to a lot of different microbes that are actually helpful. Even coming from a large family can help you out, especially if you're one of the younger children. So those of you who are the younger children from large families, this is the one time you can be thankful for that. See, the, the research doesn't explain why that gives you an advantage, but I think I know why, too. You know, those of you who are parents, you can remember your first child, right? And how you kept everything spotless or tried to. And if they dropped a pacifier on the ground... You took that thing right to the sink and you washed it with soap, maybe you even sterilized it. And then your second or third child came along and they dropped their pacifier. And what did you do? Put it right back in, right? Well, now your, your younger children can thank you because you've done them a favor. In our worries over germs, we tried to control the dirt that our kids got into. And in the end, it made them sicker. And you see this problem over and over again. We seek to eliminate our worries by controlling other things and other people, but it just leads to disaster. <clears throat> Killing the sparrows killed people. Eliminating dirt increased diseases. But the worst example is what they did to Jesus. It's a little hard for us Christians in 2022 to understand why anyone wouldn't like Jesus. I mean, he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he even brought a dead man back to life. He taught loving God and loving our neighbor and, and even paying taxes. And the most violent thing he did was flip over a table in the temple. I mean, why in the world would anyone want him dead? Why are we just two weeks away from celebrating the Friday when they nailed him to a cross? Well, I think if you look closely at the Bible, you see that the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees 
were worried. They were worried that Jesus wasn't strict enough in following the biblical laws. They worried that Jesus was leading people astray. They worried that Jesus hung out with the wrong people. They worried that his popularity would cause the Roman government to take away their political power. And the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he worried about the roaring crowds demanding Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus worried them all. And to ease that worry, they needed to control Jesus. Unfortunately for them, Jesus refused to do things their way. Jewish law was very strict about the Sabbath, and the Pharisees were the strictest group of Jews. No wonder they thought Jesus wasn't being strict enough when he he said that the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. Look at how upset they got at Jesus with his lax Sabbath keeping. I'm going to read some, some verses from chapter 12 in Matthew. Starting with verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath. Harvesting grain was work. And no matter that it was just a handful of grain, and no matter that they were hungry, they were not following the laws strictly enough. And they needed Jesus to correct them. At least that's what the Pharisees thought. But Jesus wouldn't. Instead, he tells the Pharisees, you wouldn't condemn my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And Jesus kept on breaking the rules. Verse 9, going on from that place, he went into a synagogue, their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Jesus does miracles, but all it does is upset the Pharisees because he's not following the laws the way they see it. He's out of control. And the only way they can control him is to kill him. And these religious leaders, I mean, these, these aren't awful, terrible people. These were the religious leaders. They can justify murder in their own mind. Because if a Sabbath breaker like Jesus has power, That power must come from the devil. Jesus must be in league with the devil. Here's verse 22. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? They're saying, Could this be the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Everything that Jesus did worried them. Even the people he ate with. Because, of course, he ate with the wrong people. Back in Matthew 9, we hear, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Everything that Jesus did upset them, and so they needed to control him. They were worried about what he did. They're they're worried about that he didn't follow the Jewish traditions of ritual cleanliness. Now, this isn't mom trying to keep germs away from her kids, but this is ritual cleanliness. 
and he wasn't promoting good spiritual hygiene. Matthew 15 finds this. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? <clears throat> they don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? Everything that Jesus did worried them. And they needed to control him. Most of all, they were worried that he was becoming too popular. After he raised Lazarus from the dead, so many people heard, so many people began to follow Jesus that he became a threat to the world as they knew it. Hear this from John chapter 11. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and seen what Jesus did, that is, raised Lazarus, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. That's their assembly group. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. They worried about Jesus, so they had to control him. And the only way to control him was to kill him. That's how worry led to the most awful murder in all history, the crucifixion of the Son of God. Now, technically, those religious leaders didn't kill Jesus. Crucifixion was a Roman punishment. But they brought the charges against him and they shouted for his death. And this is how John tells it in John 19. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. Pilate was worried, he was afraid, and so he sent Jesus to the cross. You know, sometimes our worry causes us to seek to control things with disastrous consequences. Sparrows are smashed, kids get sick, and Jesus is crucified. But it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to worry, we don't have to control other people or, or other things. We can let God be in control. Consider the sparrows, they don't, they don't worry a lick, but God puts people like me and Tammy and you all to feed them. And if we aren't there, God feeds them through the the things that are there in the wild. As Jesus says, look at the birds of the air, they don't sow or reap. They don't store away in barn, yet, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your Father's care. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. These are the words of one who knew that, that he himself would be crucified by frightened people trying to stay in control. But we don't have to follow in their footsteps. We can consider the sparrows. And we can let God be in control of our lives and those around us. We can follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Let us pray.
Lord, we are just a week away from Holy Week. A week that perplexes us. We have a hard time figuring out why anybody would want to kill Jesus. Someone who is so good, so holy, so loving. But we know, Lord, what worry can do. And we know what happens when we try to, to seize control, to force things our way, instead of letting you be in control and letting go of the worry. So Lord, help us to do that this week. Help us to let go and let you be God and be in control of our lives. Amen.